Well, this is a, uh, a wonderful, I love this scripture, Matthew 16, verse 21 to 27. And part of it is because as a youngster, when before the rise of the shopping malls, you shop down at Howard and Lexington Street. And when I lived out in, in Overly with my parents, the, we would get on the number 15 streetcar, which um, just ended just seven blocks from our house or up on Blair Road. And then we would go in and we would wind up and going to the Heck Company or to uh, um, Hoschilds or Hutzlers. We almost never went into Stewart's, that was too expensive. But the, uh, um, and there were stops that we'd make along the way. Mom would often stop in at St. Alphonsus Church down on uh, Saratoga Street. And the, uh, there was also her own, own church at Baltimore and Lakewood, St. Elizabeth's. And in St. Elizabeth's, they had written in letters that had to be several feet high in the main sanctuary around the half dome. What would it profit a man to gain the whole world but lose their immortal soul? Well, as, as a youngster, um, that was pretty impressive. It made a big impression on me. What would it profit a man to gain the whole world but lose their immortal soul? Well, it, before we get into this scripture about that, I have to tell you a, a, a joke. It says this. A lawyer, and please, for all the lawyers, please don't sue me. Please, please forgive me. You know, you can always give me a restraining order if you want, but the, a lawyer was working in his office when Satan appeared. Satan said, I can make it so you win every case in your career, and you make huge piles of money. In exchange, you will sell me your soul, your wife's soul, your children's souls, your parents' souls, your grandparents' souls, and the souls of all your friends. The lawyer thought about it for a moment and then said, what's the catch? There's only two people here that are laughing, so I suppose that it... Oh, thank you. That, that, that's an insincere laugh, I can tell, you know. The, uh, so what's the catch? Well, part of the problem is, while well, we look at that story and we go, right, who would do that? And yet there are plenty of people that are, just aren't making the right decisions in life. They're losing their souls and whatever it is that they're pursuing that has become an idol to take the place of God and fill in what that could possibly be, the different ways that we substitute God's will for evil actions, God's salvific will for things that cannot save. God's life-giving path for things that do not last forever. I came across this sermon. I can't take credit for it, only for finding it. Um, it was by uh, a pastor, uh, Dr. Chester Michael Anders. They called him Mickey Anders. He's the pastor of South Elkhorn Christian Church, the Disciples of Christ. And he says about this chapter in Matthew, Jesus shares the stunning prediction of how he would be violently killed by his enemies. This is the first of three such predictions that Jesus would make. These words were hard for the disciples to hear because it was so far out of their expectations of what the Messiah was supposed to be. Remember last weekend we had the confession of Peter when Jesus says, who do people say I am? And, and, Pete, and, then they, and they give the example, some say Jeremiah, some say Elijah, some say John the Baptist or one of the prophets. He says, but you, who do you say I am? And he, for us, I really, I could probably best be translated as, but what am I to you? Or what difference do I make in your life? What, who, what do you see me as when you look at me? And of course, Peter says, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. And then Jesus says, Happy are you, Simon, son of John. No mere man has his clothes to you, but my Father in heaven. And I, for my part, say upon this rock that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So Peter's faith, profession of faith, as Jesus being the Christ, the Son of the living God, is the foundation of the church. But now, Peter, when Jesus says what the Son of the living God must accomplish, Peter says, God forbid this should happen to you, that you should be killed. This should never be done. And so here we find 
Peter's immediate rejection of Jesus' death. Of course, Peter was examining the issue by human earthly reasoning. He couldn't, he thought it disgraceful to Jesus that he would even contemplate such a, a fate because Peter had recognized Jesus as the Christ, the Son of the living God. This was well known terminology in Jewish tradition. But the common understanding was that the arrival of the Jewish Messiah was to herald the defeat of Israel's enemies and the victory of God's chosen people over all their oppressors. The Messiah would be a powerful figure with a military answer to Israel's problems. The Messiah was not to be an unarmed teacher killed in the most shameful, humiliating form of execution that Romans had at their disposal. Peter didn't want to hear that. Peter had learned that Jesus is the Son of God, but he had not learned of the mystery of the cross and the resurrection. And no wonder Jesus forbade them to tell others about it, because if it's so confounded the disciples, who should have been the closest to Jesus, then those who knew even less about Jesus would have been completely confused and unwilling to accept it. And we know in the different scriptures, when Jesus would go on to describe who he was, my flesh is real food, my life, my blood is real drink. Unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you shall have no life within you. There were those that from that point on refused to walk in his company. The passages in which Jesus tells us, tells his followers to take up the cross implicitly tell the story of what happened to many who followed Jesus. Some were left destitute. Some ended up on literal crosses of their own. I like the fact that Peter, when he wound up on the cross, said that it was, he was not worthy to die the same death as Jesus, so he has to be put upside down. That was very, very humbling when I heard that, but then a doctor told me that it's actually easier if you're crucified upside down because you tend to lose consciousness quicker. So I don't know what was uppermost in Peter's mind. But it, since Peter is such a human person, I think that part of the foundation of the church isn't just a confession of who Jesus is, but the fact that Peter, Peter himself struggled to be a constant follower of Jesus. Sometimes he, he denied Jesus, but would still follow from a distance because he still felt this connection that went beyond his doubts, beyond his confusion, and beyond his fear. At one point, St. Paul said, you know, that love driveth out all fear. And Jesus, at different times, said to those who were seeking healing, like I think it was the, uh, the synagogue uh, leader who went to Jesus and said, my child is at death's door. And on the way there, people came out from the house and said, the child has died don't bother the master anymore. And Jesus turned and said, fear is useless. What is needed now is faith. And that faith is the key that enables us to undertake the willingness to take up our cross because we then know that G Christ promises eternal life in the losing of our life. He promises that we will find salvation in the giving of our life. He promises that it is that path of denial of self that actually gains us everything, everything that's of importance, even more important than everything else that the whole world seeks. When we become Christians, our faith in Christ calls us away from our old identities. St. Paul used to say, it is no longer I that live, but that Christ that lives within me. Even then, St. Paul still would struggle, or he would talk about the, there are three things that last, faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of these is love, and charity does away with a multitude of sins. Peter still, uh, uh, St. Paul still found himself saying things like, Alexander the coppersmith did me a great deal of harm, but God is going to bring that man to a bad end. And I love the fact that these things get into the Bible, you know, because it shows the struggle that people have. And it, it's in the struggle that we persevere. Look how people are struggling today under, you know, something that the world went through a hundred years plus ago, but which I think we never anticipated would happen in this way across the whole world. Look at also the struggle 
that's happening with, with the economy, with people who are unable to work or whose, whose jobs are going to probably be erased you know, as this pandemic unfolds. Look at the people struggling to be able to both work and take care of their children. Look at the people that are struggling in order to try to just keep their sanity and their mental health so that they give to one another in their homes the things that they really need. Do you sometimes find that you feel like you're losing your mind in the midst of this constant, you know, day after day, eternal sameness? Inability to even hug or touch in the ways that not only we took for granted, but which we also realize now meant so much to us? You know, this, this is a struggle. And look at the struggle that we have to bring our faith to. It's not enough to merely say God never promised us a rose garden. It's enough to say that we have to keep the faith. We have to keep the flame of faith burning in our heart. That, you know, come Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and inspire them with your divine love. Send forth your spirit and we shall be created and you shall renew the face of the earth. And speaking of the renewal of the face of the earth, look at how the whole world is awakening to finally beginning to say, we too, people of all colors and people of, of whiteness, I guess, um, you know, uh, people of no color, though I suppose technically we're pink, <laughs> um, how people the whole world over have awakened to the racism that has created you know, systemic suffering for people of color, and over the whole world, they are arising and saying, no more, enough. I stand with my sister and my brother. And what enables them and us to recognize that isn't the rightness or wrongness of our particular positions in life. It is in seeing the suffering, the unjust suffering of people that raises up in us compassion, which then means we're thinking not just with our minds, but we're being touched at our very gut, our heart and our soul. You don't talk about people taking up their cross to follow Christ. You look at Dr. Martin Luther King, you look at the civil rights leaders, you look at John Lewis, you look at the people who are willing to go and march in peaceful protest and not take up violence, and be beat within an inch of their life and still step forward to say the same thing again and again. It's no different from the disciples who after they were charged with saying, speak no more about this man. And then they were beat. And then afterwards, they went out gladly preaching about Jesus. And the scripture said they were happy that they had done such a job that they deserved to be beaten for it. Now that's taking up your cross. Look at how people are, are deciding not to even play certain games because they're saying, in this world, there are other things that are more important than just what we do on a day-to-day -day -day basis, what it is that pays our living. And these are people who have a very good living, at least for a while, willing to step aside from that. I always thought that Colin Kaepernick was a person who took a great risk and, and had to endure you know, the results of his upright decision. It, it always struck me as a tremendous distraction that when people were taking a knee during the national anthem because of their concern for those who were suffering from racial injustice and systemic suffering in our institutions and in our world today, that the distraction was, oh, this is, this is disrespecting our military or our national anthem. No. You know, the purpose was to draw attention to the plight of our sisters and brothers. And now, after other people have taken that courageous step, now more and more people are coming to understand. And that's what happened in the civil rights. Uh, when children, it wasn't until People were very happy to say segregation, yes, yesterday, today, and tomorrow, and now and forever. But when they saw that children were being washed down the streets by fire hoses, and they saw that dogs were being set upon people who were peacefully protesting, they said, this is unjust. 
when they heard about the children being killed in the bombing of the churches, they said, this is not right. And so the compassion that we awaken to enables us to follow Jesus, despite whatever is going to happen to us, because we know we cannot stand by and turn a blind eye or not stand with our sister and our brother. We are struggling today to hold on to the word of God. Jeremiah found it very difficult. And he said, violence and outrage is all that I preach. And yet, you know, I will do it no longer. But when he tried to not mention the Lord's name, he said it burned within him. And he could not endure it. And so, just as Peter struggles to accept what Jesus is saying, that Jesus himself must do, what the Messiah must do to effect the salvation and to give an example of selfless self-giving that leads to salvation. Well, the same thing is true for us where we find it hard sometimes to do the right thing. LBJ one time during the Vietnamese War was struggling with how to manage what was then the obligations of CETO, like NATO. But it was a war that was opposed. And at one point he said, as he was trying to find what decisions to make, he said, doing the right thing is easy. Knowing what the right thing is, is the hard thing that once you knew what the right thing was, it was easier to do it than it was to discern it. And that's is where we are awakening today, I believe, to see that there are times where we do stand with one another, even though it is a struggle. When we become Christians, we undergo a character change. We talk about it as Catholics as happening in baptism, where we become children of the light. We're given a white robe and, a white, uh, and a, light, a white candle that's lit. And the parents are extolled to keep the flame of faith burning brightly within your child's life so that when the Lord calls them from this life, they shall enter heaven in the kingdom of the saints with the brightness of their good deeds shining. Many people today, and I include myself in this, think we can have Christianity without the cross. When the cross comes to us or when we're we're called to make a decision. It's something that we may very easily find we want to shy away from. I was reading about different pastors that have been very well received by their, their flock until they began to talk about justice and racial inequality. And then they would say, we like it when you just talk about the gospel and quote the verses of the Bible. It was, I think, Dom Helder Carrera or camera, I've got his last name wrong. But he said, when I fed the poor, they called me a saint. When I asked why people were poor, they called me a communist. We cannot have Christianity without the cross and without the self-denial. We can be curious bystanders at the foot of the cross. This is what Michael Anders is saying, Mickey Anders is saying. We can be casual followers of Jesus. We take our Christianity like cream in our coffee. Just a little something added to life to make it interesting. And he then says, I'm afraid most of us have not yet heard Jesus' call to radical discipleship. We don't yet understand the real meaning of the cross. Many of us talk about the cross or display the cross without any idea of what it really calls us to undertake as followers of Christ. Jesus' call was absolute demand. When he said, follow me, he meant leaving something or someone or someplace behind. To obey meant to walk into the unknown, unencumbered, ready to listen, to learn, to witness, to serve, and to sacrifice yourself. Jesus always wants us to count the cost, but make no doubt about it. He calls those who would be his disciples to come and die. If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. Have you heard this call to a radical discipleship? Does your faith entail a radical commitment to Christ? Are you willing to die with him? Are you willing to take upon yourself appropriation, you know, and ostracizing of others? 
or are we all still ready to go through the motions with a casual Christianity? Jesus tells us there are two roads which represent two contrasting ways of life. The first way is that of saving our lives out of fear. The other road is losing our lives out of faith. Let me repeat that. The first way is that of saving our lives out of fear. The other road is losing our lives out of faith. One way is traveled by the people who seek power and status for themselves. The other is followed by people who relinquish status and power in order to bring the good news of God. Dr. Chester Michael Anders, the pastor, says, Two roads stand before us. There is the way of the divine things, the way of Christ, and then there's the way of human things. This is why Jesus says, get behind me, Satan, to Peter. You're not thinking as God thinks, but you're thinking as humans judge. There is a way to save your life, and there's a way to lose it. There's a way to lose your life for the sake of the kingdom, and there you will find it. And here's this little story that uh, Dr. Pastor Anders puts in. He says, Joseph Tan was pastor of a Baptist church in Romania while that country was ruled by communists. The authorities hated him because of his preaching. They arrested him and they threatened to kill him. Pastor Tan said to the arresting officer, sir, your supreme weapon is killing. My supreme weapon is dying. Sir, you know my sermons are all over the country on tapes now. If you kill me, you will be sprinkling them with my blood. Whoever listens to them after that will say, you'd better listen, this man sealed it with his blood. They will speak ten times louder than before. So go on, kill me. Then I will win the supreme victory. The officer sent the pastor home. The pastor Tan then said, for years I was a Christian who was cautious because I wanted to survive. I had accepted all the restrictions the authorities put on me because I wanted to live. Now, I wanted to die and they wouldn't oblige. Now I could do whatever I wanted in Romania. For years I wanted to save my life and I was losing it. Now that I wanted to lose it, I was winning. 